Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so come back, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How do the dead come back, Mother? Today, you? You What's the secret of the dead? Number 13 by M. R. James Among the towns of Jutland, Viborg justly holds a high place. It is the seat of a bishopric. It has a handsome but almost entirely new cathedral, a charming garden, a lake of great beauty, and many storks. Near it is Hald, accounted one of the prettiest things in Denmark, and hard by is Finderup, where Marsk Stee murdered King Eric Glipping on St. Cecilia's Day in the year 1286. Fifty-six blows of square-headed iron maces were traced on Eric's skull when his tomb was opened in the 17th century. But I am not writing a guidebook. There are good hotels in Viborg. Preislers and the Phoenix, a Walder can be desired. But my cousin, whose experiences I have to tell you now, went to the Golden Lion the first time that he visited Viborg. He has not been there since and the following pages will perhaps explain the reason of his abstention. The Golden Lion is one of the very few houses in the town that were not destroyed in the Great Fire of 1726, which practically demolished the cathedral, the Sonnekirke, and the Rathaus, and so much else that was old and interesting. It is a great red brick house, that is, the front is of brick with corby steps on the gables and a text over the door but the courtyard into which the omnibus drives is of black and white cage work in wood and plaster. The sun was declining in the heavens when my cousin walked up to the door, and the light smote full upon the imposing façade of the house. He was delighted with the old-fashioned aspect of the place, and promised himself a thoroughly satisfactory and amusing stay in an inn so typical of old Jutland. It was not business, in the ordinary sense of the word, that had brought Mr. Anderson to Viborg. He was engaged upon some researches into the church history of Denmark, and it had come to his knowledge that in the Rizavik of Viborg there were papers, saved from the fire, relating to the last days of Roman Catholicism in the country. He proposed, therefore, to spend a considerable time, perhaps so much as a fortnight or three weeks, in examining and copying these and he hoped that the Golden Lion would be able to give him a room of sufficient size to serve alike as a bedroom and a study. His wishes were explained to the landlord, and after a certain amount of thought, the latter suggested that perhaps it might be the best way for the gentleman to look at one or two of the larger rooms and pick one for himself. It seemed a good idea. The top floor was soon rejected as entailing too much getting upstairs after a day's work, the second floor contained no room of exactly the dimensions required, but on the first floor there was a choice of two or three rooms which would, so far as size went, suit admirably. The landlord was strongly in favour of number 17, but Mr. Anderson pointed out that its windows commanded only the blank wall of the next house, and that it would be very dark in the afternoon. Either number 12 or number 14 would be better, for both of them looked on the street, and the bright evening light, and the pretty view would more than compensate him for the additional amount of noise. Eventually, number twelve was selected. Like its neighbours, it had three windows, all on one side of the room. It was fairly high and unusually long. There was, of course, no fireplace, but the stove was handsome and rather old, a cast-iron erection on the side of which was a representation of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, and the inscription... One Bogmose Cap 22 above. Nothing else in the room was remarkable. The only interesting picture was an old coloured print of the town, date about 1820. Supper time was approaching, but when Anderson, refreshed by the ordinary ablutions, descended the staircase, there were still a few minutes before the bell rang. He devoted them to examining the list of his fellow lodgers. As is usual in Denmark, their names were displayed on a large blackboard divided into columns and lines, the numbers of the rooms being painted in at the beginning of each line. The list it was not exciting. There was an advocate, or Sargforer, a German, and some bagmen from Copenhagen. 
The one and only point which suggested any food for thought was the absence of any number thirteen from the tale of the rooms, and even this was a thing which Anderson had already noticed half a dozen times in his experience of Danish hotels. He couldn't help wondering whether the objection to that particular number, common as it is, was so widespread and so strong as to make it difficult to let a room so ticketed, and he resolved to ask the landlord if he and his colleagues in the profession had actually met with many clients who refused to be accommodated in the thirteenth room. He had nothing to tell me. I am giving the story as I heard it from him, about what passed at supper and the evening, which was spent in unpacking and arranging his clothes, or books and papers, was not more eventful. Towards eleven o'clock he resolved to go to bed, but with him, as with a good many other people nowadays, an almost necessary preliminary to bed if he meant to sleep was the reading of a few pages of print, and he now remembered that the particular book which he had been reading in the train, and which alone would satisfy him at the present moment, was in the pocket of his greatcoat, then hanging on a peg outside the dining room. To run down and secure it was the work of a moment, and as the passages were by no means dark, it was not difficult for him to find his way back to his own door. So at least he thought. But when he arrived there and turned the handle, the door entirely refused to open, and he caught the sound of a hasty movement towards it from within. He had tried the wrong door, of course. Was his own room to the right or to the left? He glanced at the number. It was thirteen. His room would be on the left, and so it was. And not before he had been in bed for some minutes, had read his wonted three or four pages of his book, blown out his light and turned over to go to sleep, did it occur to him that whereas on the blackboard of the hotel there had been no number thirteen, there was undoubtedly a room numbered thirteen in the hotel. He felt rather sorry he hadn't chosen it for his own. Perhaps he might have done the landlord a little service by occupying it, and given him the chance of saying that a well-born English gentleman had lived in it for three weeks, and liked it very much, but probably it was used as a servant's room or something of the kind. After all, it was most likely not so large or good a room as his own, and he looked drowsily about the room which was fairly perceptible in the half-light from the street lamp. It was a curious effect, he thought. Rooms usually look larger in the dim light than the full one, but this seemed to have contracted in length and grown proportionately higher. Well, well, sleep was more important than these vague ruminations, and to sleep he went. On the day after his arrival, Anderson attacked the Riegsarvik of Weiborg. He was, as one might expect in Denmark, kindly received, and access to all that he wished to see was made as easy for him as possible. The documents laid before him were far more numerous and interesting than he had at all anticipated. Besides official papers, there was a large bundle of correspondence relating to Bishop Jürgen Fries, the last Roman Catholic who held the see, and in these there cropped up many amusing and what are called uh, intimate details of private life an individual character. There was much talk of a house owned by the bishop, but not inhabited by him in the town. Its tenant was apparently somewhat of a scandal and a stumbling block to the reforming party. He was a disgrace, they wrote, to the city. He practised the secret and wicked arts, and had sold his soul to the enemy. It was of a piece with the gross corruption and superstition of the Babylonish church that such a viper and blood-sucking trolldmand should be patronised and harboured by the bishop. The bishop met these reproaches boldly. He protested his own abhorrence of all such things as secret arts, and required his antagonists to bring the matter before the proper court, of course, the spiritual court, and sift it to the bottom. No one could be more ready and willing than himself to condemn Magister Nicholas Franken if the evidence showed him to have been guilty of any of the crimes informally alleged against him. Anderson had not time to do more than glance at the next letter of the Protestant leader, Erasmus Nielsen, before the record office was closed for the day, but he gathered its general tenor, which was to the effect that Christian men were now no longer bound by the decisions of the bishops of Rome and that the bishop's court was not, and could not be, 
a fit or competent tribunal to judge so grave and weighty a cause. On leaving the office, Mr. Anderson was accompanied by the old gentleman who presided over it, and as they walked, the conversation very naturally turned to the papers of which I have just been speaking. Her Scavanius, the archivist of Viborg, though very well informed as to the general run of the documents under his charge, was not a specialist in those of the Reformation period. He was much interested in what Anderson had to tell him about them. He looked forward with great pleasure, he said, to seeing the publication in which Mr. Anderson spoke of embodying their contents. This house of the Bishop Fries, he added, it is a great puzzle to me where it could have stood. I have studied carefully the topography of old Weiborg, but it is most unlucky of the old terrier of the bishop's property, which was made in 1560, and of which we have the greatest part in the archive, just the piece which had the list of the town property is missing. Never mind, perhaps I shall some day succeed to find him. After taking some exercise, I forget exactly how or where, Anderson went back to the Golden Lion, his supper, his game of patience, and his bed. On the way to his room, it occurred to him that he had forgotten to talk to the landlord about the omission of number 13 from the hotel, and also that he might as well make sure that number 13 did actually exist before he made any reference to the matter. The decision was not difficult to arrive at. There was the door with its number as plain as could be, and work of some kind was evidently going on inside it, for as he neared the door, he could hear footsteps and voices, or a voice, within. During the few seconds in which he halted to make sure of the number, the footsteps ceased, seemingly very near the door, and he was a little startled at hearing a quick hissing breathing, as of a person in strong excitement. He went on to his own room, and again he was surprised to find how much smaller it seemed now than it had when he selected it. It was a slight disappointment, but only slight. If he found it really not large enough, he could very easily shift to another. In the meantime, he wanted something. As far as I remember, it was a pocket handkerchief out of his portmanteau, which had been placed by the porter on a very inadequate trestle or stool against the wall at the farthest end of the room from his bed. Here was a very curious thing. The portmanteau was not to be seen. It had been moved by officious servants. Doubtless the contents had been put in the wardrobe. No, none of them were there. This was vexatious. The idea of a theft he dismissed at once. Such things rarely happened in Denmark. But some piece of stupidity had certainly been performed, which is not so uncommon, and the stupiger must be severely spoken to. Whatever it was that he wanted, it was not so necessary to his comfort that he could not wait till the morning for it, and he therefore settled not to ring the bell and disturb the servants. He went to the window, the right-hand window it was, and looked out on the quiet street. There was a tall building opposite with large spaces of dead wall, no passers-by, a dark night, and very little to be seen of any kind. The light was behind him, and he could see his own shadow clearly cast on the wall opposite. Also, the shadow of a bearded man in number 11 on the left who passed to and fro in shirt sleeves once or twice, and was seen first brushing his hair, and later on in a nightgown. Also, the shadow of the occupant of number 13 on the right. This might be more interesting. Number 13 was, like himself, leaning on his elbows on the windowsill looking out into the street. He seemed to be a tall, thin man, or was it by any chance a woman? At least it was someone who covered his or her head with some kind of drapery before going to bed. And, he thought, it must be possessed of a red lampshade, and the lamp must be flickering very much. There was a distinct playing up and down of a dull red light on the opposite wall. He craned out a little to see if he could make any more of the figure, but beyond a fold of some light, perhaps white material on the windowsill, he could see nothing. Now came a distant step in the street, and its approach seemed to recall number 13 to a sense of his exposed position. Very swiftly and suddenly, he swept aside from the window, and his red light went out. Anderson, who had been smoking a cigarette, laid the end of it on the windowsill, and went to bed. 
Next morning he was woken by the stew pigger with hot water, etc. He roused himself and, after thinking out the correct Danish words, said as distinctly as he could, You must not move my portmanteau. Where is it? As is not uncommon, the maid laughed and went away without making any distinct answer. Anderson, rather irritated, sat up in bed, intending to call her back, but he remained sitting up, staring straight in front of him. There was his portmanteau on its trestle, exactly where he had seen the porter put it when he first arrived. This was a rude shock for a man who prided himself on his accuracy of observation. How could it possibly have escaped him the night before? He did not pretend to understand. At any rate, there it was now. The daylight showed more than the portmanteau. It let the true proportions of the room with its three windows appear, and satisfied its tenant that his choice, after all, had not been a bad one. When he was almost dressed, he walked to the middle one of the three windows to look out at the weather. Another shock awaited him. Strangely unobservant he must have been last night. He could have sworn ten times over that he had been smoking at the right-hand window the last thing before he went to bed, and here was his cigarette end on the sill of the middle window. He started to go down to breakfast, rather late, but number thirteen was later. Here were his boots outside his door, a gentleman's boots. So then, number thirteen was a man, not a woman. Just then he caught sight of the number on the door. It was fourteen. He thought he must have passed number thirteen without noticing it. Three stupid mistakes in twelve hours were too much for a methodical, accurate-minded man, so he turned back to make sure. The next number to fourteen was number twelve, his own room. There was no number thirteen at all. After some minutes devoted to a careful consideration of everything he had had to eat and drink during the last twenty-four hours, Anderson decided to give the question up. If his sight or his brain were giving way, he would have plenty of opportunities for ascertaining that fact. If not, then he was evidently being treated to a very interesting experience. In either case, the development of events would certainly be worth watching. During the day he continued his examination of the Episcopal correspondence, which I have already summarised. To his disappointment it was incomplete. Only one other letter could be found which referred to the affair of Magister Nicholas Franken. It was from the Bishop Jürgen Fries to Erasmus Nielsen. He said, Although we are not in the least degree inclined to assent to your judgment concerning our court, and shall be prepared, if need be, to withstand you to the uttermost in that behalf, yet, for as much as our trusty and well-beloved Magister Nicholas Franken, against whom you have dared to allege certain false and malicious charges, hath been suddenly removed from among us. It is apparent that the question for this time falls. But forasmuch as you further allege that the Apostle and Evangelist St. John in his heavenly apocalypse describes the Holy Roman Church under the guise and symbol of the Scarlet Woman, be it known to you, etc. Search as he might, Anderson could find no sequel to this letter, nor any clue to the cause or manner of the removal of the causus belli. He could only suppose that Franken had died suddenly, and as there were only two days between the date of Nielsen's last letter, when Franken was evidently still in being, and that of the bishop's letter, the death must have been completely unexpected. In the afternoon he paid a short visit to Hald and took his tea at Bakkerlund, nor could he notice, though he was in a somewhat nervous frame of mind, that there was any indication of such a failure of eye or brain as his experiences of the morning had led him to fear. At supper he found himself next to the landlord. Uh, what? he asked him, after some indifferent conversation. It is the reason why in most of the hotels one visits in this country. The number thirteen is left out of the list of rooms. Uh, I see you have none here. The landlord seemed amused. To think that you should have noticed a thing like that. I've thought about it once or twice myself, to tell the truth. An educated man, I've said, has no business with these superstitious notions. I was brought up myself here in the high school of Weiborg, and our old master was always a man to set his face against anything of that kind. He's been dead now this many years. A fine, upstanding man he was, and ready with his hands as well as he said. 
I recollect us boys on a snowy day. Here he plunged into reminiscence. Then you don't think there is any particular objection to having a number 13, said Anderson. Ah, to be sure. Well, you understand, I was brought up to the business by my poor old father. He kept a hotel in Aarhus first, and then, when we were born, he moved to Weiburg here, which was his native place, and had the phoenix here until he died, and that was in 1876. Then I started business in Silkeborg, and only the year before last I moved into this house. Then followed more details as to the state of the house and business when first taken over. And when you came here, was there a number 13? No, no, I was going to tell you about that. You see, in a place like this, the commercial class, the travellers, are what we have to provide for in general. And put them in number 13? Why, they'd sooner sleep in the street or sooner. As far as I'm concerned myself, it wouldn't make a penny difference to me what the number of my room was. And so I've often said to them, but they stick to it that it brings them bad luck. Quantities of stories I have among them of men that have slept in a number 13 and never been the same again, or lost their best customers. Or one thing and another, said the landlord, after searching for a more graphic phase. Then what do you use your number 13 for? said Anderson, conscious, as he said the words of a curious anxiety, quite disproportionate to the importance of the question. My number 13? Why? Don't I tell you that there isn't such a thing in the house? I thought you might have noticed that. If there was, it would be next door to your own room. Well, yes, only I happen to think... <laughs> that is, I fancied last night that I'd seen a door number 13 in that passage, and really, I'm, I'm almost certain. I must have been right, for I saw it the night before as well. Of course, Sir Christiansen laughed this notion to scorn, as Anderson had expected and emphasised with much iteration the fact that no number 13 existed or had existed before him in that hotel. Anderson was in some ways relieved by this certainty, but still puzzled, and he began to think that the best way to make sure whether he had indeed been subject to an illusion or not was to invite the landlord to his room to smoke a cigar later on in the evening. Some photographs of English towns which he had with him formed a sufficiently good excuse. Uh, Christiansen was flattered by the invitation and most willingly accepted it. At about ten o'clock he was to make his appearance, but before that Anderson had some letters to write and retired for the purpose of writing them. He almost blushed to himself at confessing it, but he could not deny that it was the fact that he was becoming quite nervous about the question of the existence of number thirteen. So much so that he approached his room by way of number eleven in order that he might not be obliged to pass the door or the place where the door ought to be. He looked quickly and suspiciously about the room when he entered it. But there was nothing beyond that indefinable air of being smaller than usual to warrant any misgivings. There was no question of the presence or absence of his portmanteau tonight. He had himself emptied it of its contents and lodged it under his bed. With a certain effort, he dismissed the thought of number 13 from his mind and sat down to his writing. His neighbours were quiet enough. Occasionally a door opened in the passage and a pair of boots was thrown out, or a bagman walked past humming to himself, and outside, from time to time, a cart thundered over the atrocious cobblestones, or a quick step hurried along the flags. Anderson finished his letters, ordered in whiskey and soda, and then went to the window and studied the dead wall opposite, and the shadows upon it. As far as he could remember, number 14 had been occupied by the lawyer, a staid man who said little at meals, being generally engaged in studying a small bundle of papers beside his plate. Apparently, however, he was in the habit of giving vent to his animal spirits when alone. Why else should he be dancing? The shadow from the next room evidently showed that he was. Again and again his thin form crossed the window, his arms waved, and a gaunt leg was kicked up with surprising agility. He seemed to be barefooted, and the floor must be well laid, for no sound betrayed his movements. Sagführer Herr Anders Jensen, dancing at ten o'clock at night in the hotel bedroom, seemed a fitting subject for any historical painting in the grand style, and Anderson's thoughts, like those of Emily in The Mysteries of Adolfo, began 
to arrange themselves in the following lines. When I return to my hotel at ten o'clock p.m., the waiters think I am unwell. I do not care for them, but when I've locked my chamber door and put my boots outside, I dance all night upon the floor, and even if my neighbors swore, I'd go on dancing all the more, for I'm acquainted with the law, and despite of all their jaw, their protests I deride. Had not the landlord at this moment knocked at the door, it is probable that quite a long poem might have been laid before the reader. To judge from his look of surprise when he found himself in the room, Herr Christiansen was struck, as Anderson had been, by something unusual in its aspect. But he made no remark. Anderson's photographs interested him mightily, and formed the text of many autobiographical discourses. Nor is it quite clear how the conversation could have been diverted into the desired channel of number 13, had not the lawyer at this moment begun to sing, and to sing in a manner which could leave no doubt in anyone's mind that he was either exceedingly drunk or raving mad. It was a high, thin voice that they heard, and it seemed dry, as if from long disuse. Of words or tune there was no question. It went sailing up to a surprising height and was carried down with a despairing moan as of a winter wind in a hollow chimney or an organ whose wind fails suddenly. It was a really horrible sound, and Anderson felt that if he had been alone he must have fled for refuge in society to some neighbour bagman's room. The landlord sat open-mouthed. I-, I don't understand it, he said at last, wiping his forehead. It is dreadful. I've heard it once before, but I made sure it was a cat. Is he mad? said Anderson. He must be. And what a sad thing. Such a good customer, too, and and so successful in his business, by what I hear, and a young family to bring up. Just then came an impatient knock at the door, and the knocker entered without waiting to be asked. It was the lawyer in dishabillé, and very rough-haired, and very angry he looked. I beg pardon, sir, he said, but I should be much obliged if you would kindly desist. He stopped, for it was evident that neither of the persons before him was responsible for the disturbance, and after a moment's lull, it swelled forth again more wildly than before. But what in the name of heaven does it mean? broke out the lawyer. Where is it? Who is it? Am I going out of my mind? Surely, Herr Jensen, it comes from your room next door. Isn't there a cat or something stuck in your chimney? This was the best that occurred to Anderson to say and he realized its futility as he spoke. But anything was better than to stand and listen to that horrible voice and look at the broad white face of the landlord all perspiring and quivering as he clutched the arms of his chair. Impossible, said the lawyer. Impossible. There is no chimney. I came here because I was convinced the noise was going on here. It was certainly in the room next to mine. Was there no door between yours and mine? said Anderson eagerly. No, sir, said Herr Jensen rather sharply, at least, not this morning. Ah, said Anderson. Nor tonight. I, I'm not sure, said the lawyer, with some hesitation. Suddenly the crying or singing voice in the next room died away, and the singer was heard seemingly to laugh to himself in a crooning manner. The three men actually shivered at the sound. Then there was a silence. Come, said the lawyer, what have you to say, Herr Christiansen? What does this mean? Good heaven, said Christiansen. How should I tell? I know no more than you, gentlemen. I pray I may never hear such a noise again. So do I, said Herr Jensen, and he added something under his breath. Anderson thought it sounded like the last words of the Psalter, Omnis Spiritus Laudet Dominum, but he couldn't be sure. But we must do something, said Anderson, the three of us. Shall we go and investigate in the next room. But that is Herr Jensen's room, wailed the landlord. It is no use. He has come from there himself. I am not so sure, said Jensen. I think this gentleman is right. We must go and see. The only weapons of defence that could be mustered on the spot were a stick and umbrella. The expedition went out into the passage, not without quakings. There was a deadly quiet outside, but a light shone from under the next door. Anderson and Jensen approached it. The latter turned the handle and gave a sudden vigorous push. No use. The door stood fast. Herr Christiansen, said Jensen, 
Will you go and fetch the strongest servant you have in the place? We must see this through. The landlord nodded and hurried off, glad to be away from the scene of action. Jensen and Anderson remained outside, looking at the door. It is number thirteen, you see, said the latter. Yes, there is your door, and there is mine, said Jensen. My room has three windows in the daytime, said Anderson, with difficulty suppressing a nervous laugh. By George, so has mine, said the lawyer, turning and looking at Anderson. His back was now to the door. In that moment, the door opened, and an arm came out and clawed at his shoulder. It was clad in ragged yellowish linen, and the bare skin, where it could be seen, had long grey hair upon it. Anderson was just in time to pull Jensen out of its reach with a cry of disgust and fright when the door shut again, and a low laugh was heard. Jensen had seen nothing. But when Anderson hurriedly told him what a risk he had run, he fell into a great state of agitation and suggested that they should retire from the enterprise and lock themselves up in one or other of their rooms. However, while he was developing this plan, the landlord and two able-bodied men arrived on the scene, all looking rather serious and alarmed. Jensen met them with a torrent of description and explanation, which did not at all tend to encourage them for the fray. The men dropped the crowbars they had brought and said flatly that they were not going to risk their throats in that devil's den. The landlord was miserably nervous and undecided, conscious that if the danger were not faced his hotel was ruined and very loath to face it himself. Luckily Anderson hit upon a way of rallying the demoralised force. Is this, he said, the Danish courage I have heard so much of? It isn't the German in there. And if it was, we are five to one. The two servants and Jensen were stung into action by this and made a dash at the door. Stop, said Anderson. Don't lose your heads. You stay out here with the light, landlord, and one of you two men break in the door and don't go in when it gives way. The men nodded, and the younger stepped forward, raised his crowbar and dealt a tremendous blow on the upper panel. The result was not in the least what any of them anticipated. There was no cracking or rending of wood, only a dull sound, as if the solid wall had been struck. The man dropped his tool with a shout and began rubbing his elbow. His cry drew their eyes upon him for a moment, then Anderson looked at the door again. It was gone. The plaster wall of the passage stared him in the face, with a considerable gash in it where the crowbar had struck. Number thirteen had passed out of existence. For a brief space they stood perfectly still, gazing at the blank wall. An early cock in the yard beneath was heard to crow, and as Anderson glanced in the direction of the sound, he saw through the window at the end of the long passage that the eastern sky was paling to the dawn. Perhaps, said the landlord with hesitation, you gentlemen would like another room for tonight, a double-bedded one. Neither Jensen nor Anderson was averse to the suggestion. They felt inclined to hunt in couples after their late experience. It was found convenient, when each of them went to his room to collect the articles he wanted for the night, that the other should go with him and hold a candle. They noticed that both number 12 and number 14 had three windows. Next morning, the same party reassembled in number 12. The landlord was naturally anxious to avoid engaging outside help, and yet it was imperative that the mystery attaching to that part of the house should be cleared up. Accordingly, the two servants had been induced to take upon them the function of carpenters. The furniture was cleared away, and, at the cost of a good many irretrievably damaged planks, that portion of the floor was taken up which lay nearest to number 14. You will naturally suppose that a skeleton, say that of Magister Nicholas Franken, was discovered. That was not so. What they did find, lying between the beams which supported the flooring, was a small copper box. In it was a neatly folded vellum document with about twenty lines of writing. Both Anderson and Jensen, who proved to be something of a paleographer, were much excited by this discovery, which promised to afford the key to these extraordinary phenomena. I possess a copy of an astrological work which I have never read, 
It has, by way of frontispiece, a woodcut by Hans Sebold Bayham, representing a number of sages seated around a table. This detail may enable connoisseurs to identify the book. I cannot myself recollect its title, and it is not at this moment within reach. But the fly leaves of it are covered with writing, and during the ten years in which I have owned the volume, I have not been able to determine which way up this writing ought to be read, much less in what language it is. Not dissimilar was the position of Anderson and Jensen after the protracted examination to which they submitted the document in the copper box. After two days' contemplation of it, Jensen, who was the bolder spirit of the two, hazarded the conjecture that the language was either Latin or Old Danish. Anderson ventured upon no surmises and was very willing to surrender the box and the parchment to the Historical Society of Vyborg to be placed in their museum. I had the whole story from him a few months later as we sat in a wood near Uppsala after a visit to the library there where we, or rather I, had laughed over the contract by which Daniel Saltanius, in later life professor of Hebrew at Königsberg, sold himself to Satan. Anderson was not really amused. Young idiot, he said, meaning Saltanius, who was only an undergraduate when he had committed that indiscretion. How did he know what company he was courting? And when I suggested the usual considerations, he only grunted. That afternoon, he told me what you have read, but he refused to draw any inferences from it and to assent to any that I drew for him. Hello, this is Tony Walker. I've only just interrupted the stories to suggest that you might want to join my mailing list. If you join my mailing list, you get an MP3 audiobook of my The Dalston Vampire with sound effects and an EPUB copy for you to read on your Kindle or whatever device you use. I use the list to keep in touch with my supporters. I email very infrequently, mostly because I forget. It's usually to let you know I've got a new book out or an audio book out. If that sounds like something you'd like to sign up for, just head over to the website www.ghostpod.org and follow the links to sign up the mailing list. Sorry to interrupt. Normal service is now resumed. Well, that was number 13 by the master himself, Monty James, Montague Rhodes James. And that was a commission, so I was actually paid to do that by Gavin Critchley, and that's the second one he's commissioned. And I really take it as a sign of appreciation of my work, so that's really fantastic. Thanks, Gavin. And he very kindly has allowed his generosity be, to be shared with everybody who listens. So, brilliant. Great. Thank you, Gavin, for commissioning that story. What's to be said about it? I'm not going to say too much about James, because if you listen to this kind of story, you know everything about him, pretty much. There's a, there's a, um, a book thing called Unbound, which is like a Kickstarter for books and you pay a certain amount of money and they take two years or so to, to do the books. And do you remember I had my Damnable Tales that I unboxed? Well, this is another one like that, The Letters of M.R. James, and I'm hoping that'll come out this year, so I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, but he's a well-known, he's the, the master of his generation. What can we say about this story? It has very Jamesian things in it. There's a church, there's a document. There are kind of academic blokes, you know, the lawyer is, it turns out to be a, was he a paleographer or paleontologist? That's something to do with dinosaurs. Paleographer, so he likes old, old texts. Yeah, and a Satanism, or in fact, the dark arts. Now, I've said elsewhere about James. James has quite an interest in necromancy and magic with a K, as Alistair Crowley would have it. And you know that at the time that James was writing in his generation, there was a big fascination with the occult, people like W.B. Yeats and Arthur Macken, and I think um, Algernon and Blackwood, and many others, in fact, were members of the Golden Dawn. And I don't think M.R. James was ever a member, but he's kind of, um, what you call it, occult adjacent. I pick a lot of terms up off the internet, and uh, yoga adjacent was one. You know, somebody was described as being yoga adjacent. So they don't do yoga, but they're kind of adjacent in sentiment to yoga. 
I guess I'm yoga adjacent. I don't do yoga, but Sheila does yoga. And I think it's a jolly good thing. It's just I can't really stretch. And I know you do, people who do yoga will be saying, you know, just that's the whole point of it. Anyway, let's go back to the story. So James has his settings, obscure, old-fashioned places. And of course, the story is told at arm's length. So this is the guy's cousin who told him this story. The purpose of that, I wonder, well, James said about it to make it more believable. He said, you know, put a veil of time or place between the events so that it becomes more credible. But of course, for modern writers, that would be seen as diluting the horror because we're supposed to try and make the reader bang there, you know, so people will use first tense, first person, put you looking like a, a shoot 'em up game. Maybe that's, you know, I have a theory about movies, films, influencing writing. So novels have to be almost composed as if they were films these days. And I wonder if the next step forward is that novels will be written, stories will be written as if they were computer games, you know, and I, I'm, that is possibly happening. Anyway, back to James. He likes old things. He doesn't like computer games. In fact, he doesn't even know what a computer game is. But um, he has his own style, distanced, ancient, oh, the old church. Lots of, lots of his guys end up um, rummaging through records, don't they? And they find things. Well, he, there are some clues in this. Of course, Lovecraft does this as well. Lovecraft's people find clues in manuscripts. So do James's ancient manuscripts. And at the end, I think the astrological text, I don't really know what he's referring to there, but um, because basically it seems that Anderson, and I don't know if you were struck by the coincidence, this guy is in Denmark and he is with Jensen and Christiansen. Christiansen. I think the Danes, I did it, I looked up on YouTube and the Danes roll their eyes like a, like a German or a French are. Um, not like the Swedes or Norwegians, I don't think. But, um, so he's Andersen, Jensen and Christiansen. And he's, his name, although English, is very, in fact, the whole, you know, that sun putting at the end of it, that wasn't, that was Viking influence, not Norse influence on English, so it became a common way of making surnames in English, but probably due to the influence of the Scandinavians who, who settled there. Anyway, we, we're not wandering too far. As I was looking, as I was doing this story, I, I read um, a, a, uh, an article about arguing that James had a Catholic sensibility um, because even though he was Anglican, this medieval worldview, you know, this is, is a Catholic worldview where the world is sacred. And I thought, well, that's a lovely idea. But I'm not sure that James was Catholic at all. Uh, and he talks about the, the Babel, Babylonish church, the Church of Rome. And he's pretty anti-Catholic. Now, whether he, um, that's his view, it might have been, or it is his character's view. And we can't say. I don't know enough about James's religion, but my, my feeling would be he would be a Protestant Anglican, you know, and wouldn't think much of the Catholic Church um, and would have some rather unkind views, which were common um, between the two branches of Christianity. Anyway, so, yeah, he talks about that. And I thought, well, that's interesting, but I don't think it's true. And it's, you can say anything, can't you? You can write an article about anything and just kind of go on. I do it. And that's what I'm doing now. One of the things I think James does in his stories, and, and it was struck, I think the last one we did by James was a story of a disappearance and an appearance. And James does two things. He includes things that just are there for effect. They're almost like dressing. So unless I'm really stupid, and he was very clever, so it might be that I'm just not smart enough to pick this up. The details of the dancing person in room 13 with a red lamp flickering, the portmanteau that appears and disappears, I actually don't understand what they have to do with the story other than be bits of colour, like a painter would put a, 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 an oak tree and you know, something, that, that actually improve the whole thing, but they don't really link to the story. Now, it may be, that, as I said, that I'm just not smart enough to see the links, but I think he does this a lot, and, and in a number of his stories, there are things that you go like, well, what was that about? And they're, they're there for colour, I think. And um, just bizarreness. Because if you think about, oh, whistling, I'll come to you, my lad. The, the sheet and the figure crossing the beach. Sometimes they're just odd little things. And, 
you may have heard me talk about David Lynch on these commentaries. And one of the things about David Lynch in his films is that he, and I think he has, has expressly said this, will introduce elements that arise from the unconscious. So he doesn't actually know what they mean. He just puts them in because they feel right. He has a, they have a feeling tone that feels right in a composition. And he puts them in. And he does not explain them deliberately. And I think for me, certainly with the, the androgynous dancing, singing spirit that apparently moves portmanteaus and has some kind of red light is one of those that we sit and go, well, what was that about? I don't know. Just just was weird. And like you think of the mezzo tint with the thing crawling, some of his um, images are very strikingly outlandish and jarring. Again, you may hear me talk about theories of what it is that scares us. And, uh, you know, we talk about, we talked about the uncanny and we talk about Freud and the uncanny valley about how something that is both familiar and unfamiliar can be unsettling. And Mark Fisher wrote a book called The Weird and the Eerie and he categorises the eerie as something about agency. So something eerie is something happens and we feel that somebody has done it, but the but the, the the aim of doing that is unknown to us. And he, Mark Fisher talks about Stonehenge. Stonehenge can be eerie because there it is. Somebody did it and we don't know why. So it is agency without us understanding what the, what the aims of that agent were. So here we have this freaky thing dancing and we have no idea what it's doing. And that is the eerie, according to Mark Fisher. And I think... Certainly it's unsettling and, and again, going back to a whistle, the sheet rustling in the bed. Uh, what on earth is that about? I don't know, but it freaks me out. And even although with a mezzo tint, we have uh, some explanation of what um, gaudy it is, isn't it? It's creeping across his spirit to end the line. Just It's just the weirdness of it. So, uh, no, it's the eeriness of it, okay? So I think that is interesting and I think he does that. Uh, he also, another element that struck me was the mysterious arm. I know James was a literate man. And certainly he would have been familiar with the story of Grendel from Beowulf, the old English story whereby this horrible scaly arm appears. Just the arm, you know. And here we have in this story a horrid arm that's got some kind of horrible grey hair growing on it, which I think, again, just seems to be some outlandish detail intended to freak us out. Which... You know, arguably it did. And uh, this, this, ar this arm thing is not an uncommon motif. Uh, we talk about Grendel's arm. The Welsh story of Pwyll uh, Pendavig Dyfed from the um, Mabinogi, the, the baby Praderi is stolen by a horrid arm that just appears as an arm, and that isn't actually explained what it is either. When I lived in Wales, the, there was a village called Carno, and uh, I had this story from a guy called John Gower, who is um, a playwright and worked a lot for the BBC, but at that time he was working with me. No, I was working with him. I don't want to claim any credit or preeminence there. John is uh, a very, he's better than me. But um, he told me about the farmers who, who talk about this house that was supposedly a house, and he pointed it out to me once on the main street of Carno, and Carno is not a very big place, whereby if you sat in there overnight, this horrible scaly arm is supposed to appear. So this idea of the arm that comes, and I think this again is eerie, isn't it? Because the arm is, is a, just an arm. It's an agent. It represents agency. It wants something. It does something. But actually who it belongs to is mysterious to us. The other thing I wanted to say was, um, I haven't even talked about number 13. You know, I've worked in places where they don't have number 13. I know streets where they don't have a number 13. So, you know, it's a real thing. And it seems that what happened with 13 was that a room, because of the clue about the windows, in the dark there are only two windows and in the daylight there are three. Or is it the other way? Yeah, I think that's right. So the, uh, the inference there is that the um, number 13 has been gobbled up by 12 and 14, that there was a room and it was destroyed because of its bad reputation. And so the other two rooms became bigger and, and inherited a window each from the original 13, I guess. The, the box... Well, it's just some, it's just some occult stuff in it. I think it's just a bit of, what do they call it? The MacGuffin. Hitchcock 
used to talk about the MacGuffin. And you know, like the Maltese Falcon, the Maltese Falcon is the MacGuffin. And the, the MacGuffin can, is the thing that they all want. And it actually in itself is, is relatively meaningless, but it is invested with meaning by the story. So the story makes it important. If you found it on the street, you go, all right, what's that? You might take it to your local charity shop and g give it away to help people. Or you may try and pawn it if you're of a more mercenary. I don't know what I would do. No, I would take it to the police station and I would say, excuse me, officer, someone has left this book of occult material on the street. Uh, I, I would like to return it to its rightful owner. And if they didn't want it, I'd sell it on eBay. But what fees you have to pay on eBay, though? You know, you pay if you ever sell anything on eBay. There's enormous fees. So you think you sold something for fifty quid? You only get about forty quid. eBay snaffle the rest. I suppose eBay fees and parking tickets are the things I really don't like. Nicholas Franken, the occultist, as James says, you know, it's a bit of a a bait and switch. I, I used to say switch and bait, and somebody pointed out that was wrong. I used to also say um, dash and dine. So that, you know, you, you just haven't eaten anything. I've never dashed and dined either. This is kind of going terribly chaotic now. Nicholas Franken's corpse that we are led to believe would be there is not there, and that is does he is that, is that was that intended to trick us and make us go ah oh, I don't know. Anyway, you know you, you've got to credit James. He, he puts you there, doesn't he? I mean, his stories... I was right in that hotel with all the people. I was right in the 1880s in Vyborg. Um, I researched how to say Stigmask. Stigmask. But uh, the Vyborg and all that stuff, I didn't do that, so forgive me for my Danish. I don't know any Danish, really. I don't know some Danes, but I don't know any Danish. Anyway, so that's the story, sort of. Yes. Otherwise, life is fine. It is betwixtmas here. By the time you hear this, it won't be. But I'm sitting here between Christmas and New Year in that weird thing. And I'm working from home because uh, the, the, the trains are all messed up and the transport's all messed up because everybody's got COVID. Uh, I haven't got COVID. I think Sheila had COVID, but she kept having lateral tests. She used to do one every day and they're all negative, but she went on for days and days and days with all the symptoms. She's fine. But uh, I haven't got it. I haven't even got a cold. Um, I switched the microphone between reading the story and doing the... I don't know if you can tell. This is supposed to be a better microphone. I haven't listened back to it. So my New Year's resolution is to do just that. It's just to keep doing these. I think I'm going to continue doing the podcast, the audio podcast, once a week. And you can get additional episodes for that if you sign up on Apple. Uh, you have to... It's something like 99p or something. You can join the YouTube channel and get videos. I'm going to do a video a week. And then for my Patreons, and my Patreons are so great. I love my Patreons. They, they are really making my dream happen, honestly. And we've got to be clear about which dream that is. It's not the dream where I turned into fudge. I don't want that to happen. Um, it's, it's my dream of um, giving everything up and just uh, creating, writing and narrating. Happy betwixtmas. Happy New Year when it comes. It's going to happen tomorrow. We were going to go. Or we are going out, but I don't think we'll be out long because Sheila's still not fully recovered. She's not infectious, by the way. So don't worry about that. Negative, negative, negative on, on the things. I think she's just a bit worn out from it. Yeah, remember, you can actually commission me to do stories. What about that? Isn't that great? Okay, anyway. Bye-bye, everybody. I'll speak to you soon. Isn't that so? Isn't that so? Isn't that so? Isn't that so?